more about you. Sorry, I want to introduce someone who's one of my heroes, and Chris is one of my heroes because he cares very deeply about an issue that's important to me that I don't work on enough, but he spends all his time working on it, which is uh, the freedom of network services, uh, and he's done the more work than almost anyone in the community on this issue, and I want to hear his wonderful talk on it. All right. Well, thanks, Bradley, for the very kind introduction. Uh, so yeah, um, so this talk is about the road ahead for network freedom. Um, I am, um, so, so actually a little bit about me. Um, Bradley already somewhat introduced me, but I'm Chris Weber. Uh, I'm the lead developer of a project called GNU Media Goblin, which some of you may know of. Um, I'm also a Python developer, uh, free software and free culture activist. I've been doing this for quite a while. I've worked at a number of free software organizations. Uh, prior to this, I was doing, I was working at Creative Commons full time and at the Participatory Culture Foundation. And now I'm doing Media Goblin full time, uh, um, actually as a contractor um, through the FSF. Um, and I'll get to you about that a bit. And uh, but you're not here to, about, to hear about me, and we don't have a lot of time. So so let's let's frame the conversation. Uh, it's not very hard to frame this conversation, thanks to the last year's political situation. Uh, the present reality of network freedom is very clearly not pretty. Uh, we have corporate control of the web, uh, NSA spying, um, freedom for developers but not for users. Um, that is a phrase that I will probably repeat a few times. Uh, and, but what do we do about all this? What what actually can we do? Uh, well, I'm actually working on a project to try to do things about it. Um, and about uh, in towards the end of 2012, we actually ran a fundraising campaign with the FSF, which is what's paid for me to work um, for the last year, or if you include the time working on the fundraising campaign and the stuff since this last year, um, about a year and a half actually, um, to, uh, to to work on Media Goblin full time. And thanks to the community, uh, I'm able to be paid to, to work on this. Uh, and we had a video, which is actually probably one of the best explanations of Media Goblin we have, and also ties into a bunch of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here, so I'm actually going to play that. Apologies if you've seen it already. For just over a year now, we've been building an exciting new project for the web called the New Media Goblin. Media Goblin is a media publishing system for hosting audio, video, images, and more. It's free software, so anyone can run it and customize it. It can do a lot of cool things, including supporting multiple media types, from images to videos to audio. This means you can have all your media in one place. It's also built for extensibility, which means you can add entirely new media types, even something wild like ASCII art. Why not, right? <laughs> That's Deb Nicholson speaking, by the way. It's part of the movement to make the web a better place, but we need your help to make sure we get there. The internet and the web were designed to be decentralized. This is great because it enables a global and diverse voice. It's also very resilient. If one server goes down, for whatever reason, the internet still exists. To quote John Gilmore, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. But recently, the internet has been moving in a different direction. Instead of a resilient web of smaller and independent sites, we have larger, more centralized sites. This has several problems. For one thing, the more centralized the web becomes, the easier it is for organizations to automate censorship, either via the centralized host directly, or even through the pressures of external institutions. In such a system, the internet can't route around damage anymore. Things are much more fragile generally, too. In a more decentralized web, if one node goes out, the whole system lives on. But what if everyone's photos were on Flickr and it disappeared? What would happen if YouTube went away? What would happen to cat videos on the internet? It would be like a cat massacre. This leads to a sad internet. This is why we're building Media Goblin. Media Goblin is devoted to putting power back in the hands of users. And it's a good new project because we care a lot about freedom. We've already built a lot of stuff that's pretty awesome, so I hope you'll join us. Media Goblin supports all different types of media, and support for more types could happen soon. We have theming, so you can make it look any way you want. We also have OpenStreetMap support, so you can see where your pictures were taken. And we have commenting, and other things that web users are used to. It's working software that you can run yourself. Over the last year and a half, we've had over 50 contributors, and have made several significant releases. This is indeed exciting times. But we need your help. Media Goblin has come a long way. There's a lot more it really needs so that it can become the best media hosting option that there is. Most noticeably, we need federation. 
Federation is how email works. You and your friends might be on entirely different servers, but emailing between them feels like they're on the same thing. We want media hosting to work the same way. Status, man. Right. I'm going to stop it right there. That's about enough of that video that you need to see, maybe even a little bit more. But I, I, I brought it in there, actually. There's a reason why I replayed the thing. Um, and that's actually because I wanted to talk, first of all, you know, I'm talking about the road ahead for network freedom, but one of the most important things that I think has to do with this is actually the issue of uh, messaging. And, uh, um, and you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, this is a talk about network freedom. What is that on earth does it have to do with messaging? Why is that really important? Well, I'm going to get a little bit more science fiction-y for a second. Um, and, and I'm going to say that actually that um, uh, talk about computing, uh, computing freedom is a human right. Um, and and th this sounds very science fiction-y. And uh, this is also partly because we try and tend to treat software freedom as kind of a nerd issue, even by most of us. Um, you know, there's a lot of other soft projects we could be that, that are more important, you know, there's a lot of other issues that are more important, and we kind of tend to downplay this in some ways, and that's probably even actually fair so that we don't become into total egotistical, like, jerks, basically. Um, but actually, computing is getting closer and closer to where pretty much everything you need to do, everything you want to actually convey or actually act upon, involves computing in some sort of way. So we're actually moving to the point where this is not just a nerd environment type thing. Computing freedom affects everybody. Okay, so accepting that, um, the problem is, though, that issues of computing freedom are mostly just understood by nerds. Um, outside of hackers and academics, how many people actually understand the concepts of computing freedom, especially the concepts of free software, especially as an ethical issue? Um, and not, network non-freedom has a network effect. In networking stuff, if you take a look at, for example, how many of you have wanted to leave Facebook, maybe even left it and then came back, right? You know, probably quite a few. You know, it's very difficult to actually be able to, in a networked world, be completely free when the rest of the world is non-free. So, we actually can't just be, a no um, it, we can't live in a world of just like free software for free software nerds. It's not possible. Um, and free software, are we, anyway, we really shouldn't do it. Is this not freedom for the technically skilled few or freedom for society? And surely we've, we're in the broader social movement camp. So, and lastly, <laughs> accepting all of this, now that we know this, how do we go about it? Do we just become super smug and we're like, we know what's right, we're the free software people, all you people, you don't know what's going on. That's not going to work. That smugness is not the answer. So, what can we do to improve awareness? Um, so, um, I think that we actually have a lot of teachable moments. You know, the upside to the really terrible last year of us finding out how bad things really are in computer science, uh, uh, like in the world of computer security and stuff, is that people really latch onto this stuff. We made this video before the Snowden stuff came out, but like, you know, the FSF have had this image up on their site for the last year, and you know, um, the, um, you know, like the the thing is, is we had a lot of people actually come up to me after this video, and they were like, oh, well, you know, I wasn't sure why I cared about any of this stuff, but I really felt it after I watched your video. And what if we create materials that are for people who, you know, are not really probably going to spend the time to actually dive into reading, you know, some very academic articles about what free software means, but just get people like the equivalent of like the environmentalist level of things, right? Like environmentalism, not a lot of people actually do anything about it, but most people get the general ideas of it, right? Even if they're actually not making a lot of movement themselves. We're not anywhere near that level and that makes conversations really difficult. And the Media Goblin video is partly an attempt to actually prove that this is possible. That's my, one of my secret agendas of many secret agendas I have, I guess, not so secretly on the table all the time. Um, so next stuff, this is licensing and policy thing. Let's talk about licensing and community. There's a lot of stress about this in the, in the free software world, especially, you know, uh, probably somebody in this room tends to stress out about it more than anyone else about copyleft and permissive licenses. Um, but, but actually, I think this might actually be a symptom of something else. Um, I, and that's why I have this lovely little don't panic picture on here, um, is because uh, um, I actually think that this is a symptom, uh, um, it's actually a symptom of a different change that we've been seeing. I have a little blog post up here from one of the GitHub founders that says open source almost everything. At least everything but your secret sauce, right? Um, and this is a really po common, common discussion. In fact, little did I know that the, the secret sauce would get brought up this morning, you know, in the Twitter, Twitter conversation, right? You know, so. Over in the mid 2000s, we saw the rev rise of the Web 2.0 world, and this is like least you know, and we saw this also happen with kind of a big switch over to Macs, and kind of like a lot of people kind of an exodus from the free software desktop, and this kind of also came along in a time with a, a lot of anti-copyleft sentiments, which have just been kind of on the rise in many ways. Which this idea is like. You know, actually, in some ways, this is actually a conversation of, like, you know, the release everything but your secret sauce, but it's also kind of a, a, a developer freedom kind of thing. Like, you know, like, we can really do a lot of cool things if we just release all of the tooling 
as free software, but we'll stop right there because then we can make a bunch of money on that proprietary layer. And this, like, we can write free software stuff during the day and it'll be awesome. But now we have a bunch of free developers and the users are actually still encumbered. So this is not really, I think, actually the greatest thing. And the, the anti-copy left as the attitude is not really kind of the traditional BSD kind of like, well, I'm so against copyright that I'm against even using copyright in this type of way, which it can be an ethical stance. It's actually kind of a, well, we want to proprietize this layer type of thing. Although sometimes people trickly try to think you, uh, to make you think that they're in that, that camp. But um, so, so most devs make their license choices today on what their role models do. And who are the role models of today? The role models of today are mostly a lot of people, you know, like the leaders of Django and, and Rails and types of people like this, who have these very anti-copyleft sentiments. And so that's led to kind of like people tend to do what their role models actually do. So moving on from there, are we in a copyleft crisis or an ethical crisis? Um, I actually think that, um, that the reason why we're seeing this is because where people are working right now are in the library space. Um, and libraries tend to be more conducive to permissive licenses. And I actually think this is okay. Um, we're doing just fine infrastructure-wise. In fact, this makes my job of building the thing that's on the next layer a lot easier. But we still need to work on that next layer. Um, and so we're not really struggling on the developer freedom t side, but on the user freedom side. But is copyleft totally dead um, in, the, uh, in the web space? Well, actually, when you look at web applications, when you get to the total secret sauce releasing side of things, people actually, when they release that side as free software, tend to actually use copyleft. WordPress is under the GPL, and so is MediaWiki. City CRM is under the AGPL. StatusNet and GNU uh, Social was over to the AGPL. Pump.io, the kind of successor, is under the Apache, but that's because it was uh, for a number of reasons. One of them was because it was trying to become more of infrastructure. PageKite, Mailpile, Diaspora, Media Goblin, Gatorius, all of these are under the AGPL. So actually, when people work on that top layer, copyleft still seems to feel like a pretty good choice. So in other words, we're struggling with getting user uh, polished user-facing free software and getting in the hands of users. But when that happens, copyleft actually seems, it, it actually doesn't look so dead. It's just that we're not seeing as much movement there as we need. So freedom-aware communities are the antidote. So I think there's two things that we can do. In the infrastructure side of things, we need more people who are actually in the side of building infrastructure, even if they're in a permissive license space, who are like, actually, this top layer is really important, and I would care about not just the infrastructure side of things, but actually building, getting freedom all the way down to the user, you know? And if we actually have that, that's an opportunity to kind of get people engaged to build the tooling that we actually need. Um, but we also need people working on that top layer of things, building the user-oriented network applications of tomorrow, like Media Goblin. Um, you know, so, and we probably people will choose copyleft licenses for this. And if people give you crap for it, just say, oh, I copy, uh, I copy left what you release as your secret sauce. That's the difference right there. But right now we don't have enough polished examples. Um, and so that's partly a problem. So let's talk about deployment and adoption. Even though we actually have some software that is, um, that's released as free software, we don't have enough users and we also don't have enough people deploying this. And this is partly because it's actually very hard to run network uh, free software network services. And if somebody running a free network service, this is not a fun thing for me to admit, right? Um, so we're struggling on this. Deployment is hard. A lot of free software web applications are not packaged or just packaged in their language's environment. Um, and, the, and there's a trend toward kind of language-specific packaging environments it, with Python, you know, using virtual env and stuff like that, and kind of the whole setup tools ecosystem. And not to mention that once you actually deploy things, a editing application is not just as easy as just app get install your, um, some sort of server. You also have to tend to generally edit application files and all sorts of things like that to get things to actually work. Um, and so that, that actually makes things pretty difficult for people to deploy and then maintain. Um, so most modern web applications actually require somebody who's familiar enough with a language to actually deploy the application written in that language itself. Um, but we should be engaging in this type of thing anyway. Even though that this is actually the sad reality of it, I actually think we need to be deploying the type of... One of the reasons that Media Goblin is written in Python, despite Python being difficult to deploy in this type of thing, is I see that these types of applications, this is the way that people are writing modern web applications. So if we're not actually trying to st uh, go through the process of making those difficult to deploy applications easier to run, then we're just stuck with writing crappy applications or just not getting that deployed at all. 
And users don't tend to see this because part of the trend has been you don't run your own servers. You don't have any control over it. And then you have a team of people who are just like, you know, you've got a team of DevOps people who are both developers and system administrators, and they handle that type of stuff, and the users never see it. Um, so no, But network freedom does not have that luxury. We need people to be working on these things to make this type of stuff easier. And if we don't, we're not going to move forward on this. Now, you could actually say, but wait a minute, what about PHP? PHP, super easy to deploy, right? Well, it's sort of easy if you're using shared hosting, and but um, but the sort of things that make it easy also kind of make it easily exploited. Um, the you know how many compromised WordPress sites have you seen over the last number of years? Probably quite a few if you've had to deal with WordPress sites. Um, shared hosting is also dying, and for good reason. It's actually not a very good user freedom environment. You have very little control over that server, so this is not actually really a really great situation. And PHP is living in the past, dude. Yeah. Like, just just don't write things in PHP. That's that's my opinion. I, there are good PHP communities. I'm not a big, but I, I think that like saying like, well, we'll just got PHP and that's the solution. It's not, it's not the solution in my view. And I do acknowledge I have language bigotry though. Um, so, not just the web services though. You're like, so like, oh, you media goblins, you guys are super hard to deploy. That's the problem. You guys just don't know how to write this stuff. Well, okay, let's take a look at some other federated services. How about email, right? This has been around a while. Email's federated. We know how this works. It's been around a while, right? Super easy to deploy by now, right? I didn't even have to ask anybody because I got the, the laughing response. You know, how hard could it be? I had a friend say to me recently, I'm so tired of relying on Google for all my email. I'm going to run my own server. I'm going to just do this. I've got a Linode account. I'm going to run it. And then they went and they installed and they're like, they're like, I just said, what packages do I install? I just install the packages and I'm good, right? Like, can you describe your mail setup to me? And I'm like, well, I probably have kind of a non-standard setup. What I do, I have Postfix and I have Dovecot to deliver the mail to me and then deliver it. Um, I connect over an SSH tunnel to be able to send mail, but I also deliver to a mail... What's the question? Uh, uh, is the email hard because it... Exactly because it has been around for that long time. It's got a lot of baggage. Uh, it has some baggage, but the protocols are not that complicated in some sort of ways. But anyway, so my so so I interrupted myself. So my my setup is I've got Postfix and Dovecot delivering to things, and then I run it through pot, uh, pro, through um, proc mail, which then goes through spam assassin. I fetch it over to my machine with offline IMAP. I index it locally on my machine with MU, and then I run an Emacs client called MU4E. Super simple. Oh, by the way, my ma my mails recently got marked as spam because I wasn't sending the right headers on my uh, my mail. So like. This stuff is not easy, even if you've been struggling to learn how this stuff works for a long time. So it's, but I actually think that like email in some ways is very complex, but it's not just the protocol being kind of crufty and been around a long time that's the issue. It's that deploying and maintaining and configuring all these things are not that easy and there's not been enough space in making the configuration layer of things easy. So we need user-centric configuration and deployment and management type things. And there's actually a lot of work being done on this right now. Um, Docker, SaltStack, OpenShift, Puppet, you've probably heard of a lot of these things. Um, with the exception of OpenShift, though, um, we need these layers above the packaging world. However, um, while there's all this cool stuff that's been happening, they're mostly oriented towards sysadmins and kind of corporate environments. Um, and so, while people are like working on this type of stuff, it's not actually for that end user type of person I'm actually talking about here. So we need to get another layer above that. What we really need is configuration and deployment management for somebody who will never touch a configuration file. That's what we need. So, what can we actually do? Maybe something like OpenShift where like enough things are abstracted as a type of solution? I'm not quite sure. It's, it's something that needs to be worked on, though. I'm, I'm bus very busy working on Media Goblin, though, but I'd love to work with people who are working on this type of thing. That's a situation I'm in. So, what's the silver lining of this situation? Oh, I just made, like, deployment seem really frustrating and, like, oh, we're so fucked. But, uh, like, what are we going to do? Well, actually, there's a silver lining to this. Um, the free software desktop used to be really hard to run and maintain. People used to have parties just to get this stuff running on your machine. Um, <laughs> And we need to encourage people actually running stuff on this frontier until it gets easier. But in the meanwhile, when things are hard, that's actually an opportunity to learn cool things. I learned all sorts of things about file systems. I learned all sorts of things about like kernels and how they work and then compilers and all sorts of things I never would have learned if my computer were not so fucking hard to install in the mid 2000s and like it was so difficult, but now it's not that difficult, and these install fests have gone away. 
but maybe the install fest should come back. Maybe we should actually be in, in teaching people a whole new layer of fun, exciting things to do and scream at by installing free network web services. Uh, somebody in the back. Uh, well, I mean, I think packaging actually, like packaging with like uh, um, desktop packaging, is is a great idea. Like we should be working with those types of people. But um, I think that there's the the packaging itself doesn't just solve things. You know, just installing a mail server is not enough because you also have to configure your SSL certs, and then you've got to work with some external site for that. You've also got to be able to set things so that you've got your domain name and your blah 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 and uh, tons and tons of settings that are really complex and that are scattered. You have to sync them up across all these different configuration models. Styles. If you look on things like uh, on Puppet, um, I, I'm going to get to questions more then. But if you look on things like Salt Stack and stuff like that, you can reuse variables and stuff like that. And that's like a, something that we're not really seeing, um, like it outside on the kind of user centric side. But but we should keep moving on. So let's talk about Federation. It's not just for Star Trek. Um, Federation in this context is talking about getting the servers to actually talk to each other. So what does that actually mean for us? Um, for, for, for us, like, you know, us web services using people. Um, well, um, what do we want to do in Media Goblin, for instance? We want people to be able to, you know, comment on somebody else's photo. Sure. We also want people to be able to add somebody's, you know, video to their own gallery. We want people to add, be able to add their own images to their equivalent of the Flickr pool or something like that. We want people to be able to, you know, to, to do all the same type of social things they can normally do, but when you end up splitting it across a bunch of sites, it makes it really difficult. Um, so what's the current state of Federation? Well, um, a minor troll here, um, but uh, <laughs> if you know Pumped.io, this will be a bit funnier, but uh, <laughs> Zach's laughing. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so so, so the, the, the state of both, in, for both, so stat, what we used to have was kind of, O status was like, we were a couple years ago, actually even in the last video, we were like, O status, like O status is like where things are going protocol wise. And uh, StatusNet was kind of the application that kind of proved how this stuff works. Um, but the pump, but but actually pump.io is kind of the where things are going. Um, but but what, and there's a new API called the Pump API. And but these two things are kind of separate. But in both cases, this is kind of a flagship application that's kind of implementing the proof of the protocol. Um, but why the switch? Um, for one thing, the, the status net, uh, O status actually required uh, a whole bunch of different um, um, separate protocols that were kind of like, we're going to take this protocol and this protocol and this protocol and this protocol and bring them all together and then we'll have federation. Um, and it was kind of a meta standard in some ways. But Pump, API, uh, Pump API is a lot simpler. It's JSON based, which is what all Web 2.0 developers want these days. Um, a number of things. Um, it's also fairly easy to understand. It has privacy baked into it, which was one of the big complaints about O status. Um, and not to mention the fact that StatusNet got rewritten away from PHP towards Node, and uh, um, it was an opportunity for, I think, Evan to kind of reapproach things as that was happening. Um, so, so what about Federation and Media Goblin? What's the current state of Federation and Media Goblin? We had an extremely talented student in through Outreach Program for Women named Jessica Talon, and she was working on Federation for us. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Uh, you have a lot. Oh, okay, great. Wow, nice. Um, so the uh, um, so federation and uh, so so she was working on a library, um, both on adding federation to Media Goblin, and also building a library called PyPump to make uh, federation a lot easier within Media Goblin, uh, within Python applications of all kinds. Um, and so this has been moving along. Uh, this is actually a screenshot. Uh, when I end up getting to the thing I'll show at the end, you'll actually see it. This kind of reappear. Um, but like you actually, the current state of things is you can submit, the Pump API is actually going to be submitting both the desktop and mobile API that we currently have in Media Goblin to kind of become the Omni API for Media Goblin. But thanks to PyPump, it's super easy to write a client now. And I actually think that PyPump might even be more important than Media Goblin's implementation of uh, the Pump API. Because the way that developers learn things tends to be by picking up a library and messing around with stuff. And we didn't really have that for OStatus, but with Pump.io, very, uh, I'm sorry, Py, the Pump API, because Pump.io is software and we don't even use it in Media Goblin. Uh, with the Pump API, um, we actually are having a lot of more tooling kind of appearing right away. And that's really exciting. Um, but on the other hand, we have had this kind of fracturing in kind of the federation space. But anyway, um, so, so the federation is about 
cohesiveness uh, between different installations of like some sort of instance of things, right? What about cohesiveness <coughs> within a site itself, right? So say you want to install Diaspora and Media Goblin and you know like uh, XMPP and you want to install uh, uh, like WordPress and all this stuff and you want to have it all together. Um, in some ways, this is actually kind of difficult at the moment. Um, part of the problem is, is that multiple applications are kind of hard to theme. Um, they tend to use different templating uh, engines. They tend to have different layout decisions and patterns. And this means that um, this is actually a screenshot from the uh, jpope uh, uh, media.jpope.org. One of our con Media Goblin uh, contributors uh, runs a Media Goblin site, and he runs all of these different things. Um, well, not GitHub, obviously. Uh, but he, he runs tons of these different things, and he's actually themed each one of them. But it's a lot of work to th re-theme each thing. And so we actually have some kind of incoherence between the different applications. And that's kind of a problem. Um, so differing and incompatible auth authentication systems is also a problem. You have this installation. Why should you create eight different users for yourself on one on this type of thing? This is kind of a problem. And there's other inter-application inconsistencies. So what are we going to do about this? Um, well, do we need a desktop suite of web applications? <coughs> I'm not actually proposing that I'm going to build such a thing right now, but it's something I've been thinking about. Um, I'm actually struggling enough with a single application that I'm working on already. But, um, but, but you know, I have thought about, you know, it really might be that we actually need to have, instead of just a single application, have a, a full suite of things that kind of have clear ideas of how they work together. So. Um, that, that actually brings us back to Media Goblin and, uh, and, and what, where, where things are currently in Media Goblin itself. Um, so let's talk about accomplishments of the last year. Um, so Media Goblin, we managed to raise, uh, um, not quite hit our goal, but we managed to raise enough to be able to pay me for over a year to work on things and also uh, do some more stuff than that too. We uh, got out five major releases, not minor, five major releases, which is pretty exciting, packed full of features in each one. Uh, we have six successful outreach programs for women and summer of code internships. Uh, and actually, one of those students is actually, we got a grant where she's continuing on to work on Media Goblin uh, stuff for academic institutions and improving Media Goblin's metadata support. Um, so actually, it's been a really exciting last year. Um, and what a deal for, the, for the, the amount of money raised. We actually got tons of development in within this last year. Um, but we still have a ways to go, and Media Goblin isn't quite finished. Um, and because of that, um, what, what's going to happen? Is, is this it? Are we going to leave the cats out in the cold? Is this the, uh, the end of Media Goblin development? Um, well, no. We're actually planning to move ahead, um, and that is why um, we're actually planning on running another campaign. So, I have been scrambling like crazy to get this thing together. This room is the first room to be able to see what I've been working on over the last month to be able to get the campaign pr materials prepared. You guys have executive preview access to what's going to be released for our new campaign. And I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to play the whole thing. The internet was once a healthy... Oh, before I say this, this is intentionally a little bit corny in the sense that we decided to make this kind of like... People really like the imagery from last year, so we decided we're going to build on this. And in fact, we're going to make this like epic movie trailer sequel style. So let's see if I manage to pull it off. Oh, I should press play again. Oh no. I don't know what happened, but it's not happy. Okay. Whoa. It's a good thing I have lots of time. Uh, resilient and okay, there we go. The internet was once a healthy, resilient, and self-healing place. But then, things began to change. Power has moved from the many to the few. These corporate megasites are fragile, sometimes going out entirely. Censorship has become rampant. And the last year has shown surveillance to be creeping into the systems of the web. Centralization has infected the net at the cost of our privacy and safety, while eroding user freedom. Is there any hope for the internet we knew and loved? But wait! Something new has arrived. Something to put power back in the hands of the people. Media Goblin! Media Goblin is a media publishing system for the web. It's decentralized and social. 
With Media Goblin, you don't need to split your media across a billion separate commercial sites. Whether you want to share images, or video, or audio, or presentations, or even 3D models, Media Goblin can host it all. Media Goblin is written in Python by a community of over 75 contributors. Media Goblin is a GNU project, which means we're all about bringing freedom back to you, the user. Media Goblin's key feature is Federation. With Federation, we can provide user freedom and improve the social experience of modern media publishing sites by making the network more resilient. When you favorite a photo, post a comment to a video, or share your latest drawing, you want people to be able to see those updates. But how do you share with people on a totally different Media Goblin site? With Federation, people can be on entirely different Media Goblin sites and share as if they were in the same place. We've been working towards this using a protocol called the Pump API as implemented by Pump.io. As part of this, we've been collaborating on building a library called PyPump, which will make it easy for Python web applications of all kinds of better. We've got an accomplished crew of contributors that work hard and make things happen. We've accomplished a lot, giving out five major releases in the last year alone. This includes new features like a plugin system, 3D model support, document and PDF uploads, user curated collections and galleries, authentication plugins including Mozilla Persona support, OpenID support, LDAP support, comment preview, site administration and moderation tool, and many more. We want to make Federation happen, wrap up 1.0, add privacy features, and bring Media Goblin to the game. We can't do it without you. That's why we're asking for your support to bring the benefits of Media Goblin to everyone. Become a part of internet history. Join our Goblin Force today and help us bring about a media revolution. There we go. We better raise the money, goddammit, because I went goddamn insane over the last month on that video. But anyway, uh, so that's 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 where things are currently at. Um, here's some brief credits here. I guess I'll scroll back through them. Um, but anyway, um, the uh, um, there's been uh, so that's basically where things are at. Um, we're going to be uh, the campaign is going to be launching sometime in the next couple weeks, and uh, I'm assuming we'll send a message through the FSF and a number of other things. Uh, um, you can help by joining our community, participating, <coughs> running the software, using the software. Users are super important. Um, and, uh, you know, please donate in the upcoming campaign. Uh, we are actually hoping, if everything goes really well, I'd actually love to fund not just myself. I'm not making that much money off of this. Uh, that after we managed to pay a couple of people to do some things, and after rewards and everything, I was paid about 32000 for a year and a half worth of work. Um, they, but I don't want to pay the same to the person that I'd actually like to bring on. I'd actually love to be able to um, pay somebody to actually work completely focused on making Federation awesome. Um, and that would require um, a more funding that we actually managed to bring in last year, which means that things are going to be super ambitious if we actually manage to pull this off. Um, who knows if we will or not, but I'm really hoping that you will. And more than just do donating, I could really use help in people being able to spread the word about things. If you can write in a blog post, you know, send stuff. If you do any sort of writing on this type of stuff, I'm going to be around here tomorrow. We can talk. Um, but, you know, help spread the word about it. And thank you. What? We do have stickers. They are in my bag. I do not have the Gavroche sticker stickers, but I do have the I Love Media Goblin stickers. And that's it. That's that's what I've got. Any questions? You. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what I was talking about in the whole deployment section. Is you know that we need easier ways to be able to run software, and it's not just Media Goblin. We need easier ways to be able to run all sorts of software, 
And right now, it's actually hard within the current tooling that we have. And I actually think that we need some layers of this that are above where Media Goblin currently is, because this is a problem not just with Media Goblin, but with all sorts of software. Um, and so there, there, we need extra layers there. If people are working on these types of things, I'm interested in speaking to them. And you are raising your hand, um, so I want to speak. So, so you go ahead next. Uh, oh, right, right, okay. <laughs> the page page trade is pretty cool. I think it's actually it's it's a, a really neat thing. It does require that you actually end up proxying proxying something through something else, which actually which is actually pretty. Um, but it's pretty cool how it does things. I don't actually think that it solves all of the things though, because it doesn't solve the configuration side of things for you. And like you, if you're actually wanting to run multiple things together, you actually probably need to be able to kind of configure things so that they kind of work smoothly across it. But page kite is actually pretty awesome. Um, is Bjarni here? Um, no, uh, but uh, but uh, anyway, Bjarni is super awesome. Who works on Mage Pipe, Page Kite and also in Mailpile and actually donates stuff for us. And I think it's actually a pretty uh, neat part of the, uh, things. But I actually think we need a bit more than that too because we also need to be able to handle the configuration management and other style of things. But I th I agree. Media Goblin is not just is is actually a part of the solution, not the entire solution. We need to be working on multiple layers of these things. Can you too? So, so, so what Gnuchu was saying is that, you know, what about routers that are running free software um, and are using free software like configuration management tools and stuff like that? I actually think that that's actually a great idea. Um, everybody has a router. Everybody has a router in their home. Um, it would be great if there were easy ways to be able to run things just off of your router and you don't have to write proxying things to get around your router if you're actually, it is your router that's running things. So, so it would be great if, if people were working on that layer of things on the router level software. Sure. Right, right, right. They, so, so there are. Well, we should talk more. Basically, I don't actually know much at all about how that software works. It's not something I've spent much time in. But if there's, if that's a good way to move forward on things, then we should absolutely talk about it. Yes, um, you. Yeah, I've, I, yeah, I, I know this Freedom Box creep. Uh, actually, one of my close friends is Nick Daly, who works very hard on the Freedom Box stuff. He's awesome. Uh, I actually think, you know, like, and, and Freedom Box has been working towards these types of things. Um, I actually think uh, Freedom Box is a great idea. Um, I actually think that uh, um, the, the types of things that I'm thinking about, um, I actually don't know too much of the details of the current state of Freedom Box, to be perfectly honest, even though I'm friends with one of the people who works very hard on it. Um, but I actually think that uh, um, the, the layer of things I'm talking about also on the configuration management side of things too, um, I actually don't think we need to target towards any specific devices either. Um, I think that actually we should be building things that can be deployed exactly the same as if you're deploying it on a, a plug, or as if you're deploying it on your VPS, or if you're deploying it on all these types of things, because uh, um, because it, it really doesn't actually matter. This is the equivalent of apt. The thing that I'd actually like to see happen is the equivalent of apt for configuration management and stuff like that. I'd like things to be as easy as apt get installed, this type of stuff, and maybe clicking a couple of checkboxes. As easy as sy syntactic, if you heard me speak last year, I said the same thing. As easy as synaptic package manager, which is not to say like the best interface in the world, but easy enough where somebody can actually just kind of do that type of thing. But I I'd like it to be pretty generic also. Um, but anyway, uh, other questions or comments? You. Uh, talk about the federation in this video, and I guess you haven't written, uh, done much more coding than the pump or die, but uh, how much of the design have you done? So oh, for the design of the Federation yeah. stuff? Uh, we, yeah. well, I'd like to say that it was a lot more than we have, but uh, we, we're, we're actually still moving along in that type of stuff. We can actually, 
design is something that actually Media Goblin could use a lot more help with right now. Um, I'm actually looking for help from designers to be able to move forward on things. We have uh, one of our most awesome designers who kind of set the original uh, design for Media Goblin. Uh, sorry, not design as in the way it looks, uh, architectural design. Oh, the architecture. Just the information moves, move around. Oh yeah, we've, we've actually discussed that quite a bit. It's not it's not set in stone, but we actually have, uh, we, we've, that's that's been discussed quite a bit. Um, and the... Uh, uh, and also documented somewhere, so I can have a look at it. Sure. Um, actually, we've we've got an Ethernet pa page that we wrote up way long time ago when Jessica started working on the thing. Um, part of the thing is also that Jessica ended up, um, and actually it's what I encouraged her to do also, ended up spending a lot more time on the PyPump side of things. And we got to the point where you were able to submit the media through PyPump and, stu uh, and stuff like that, but um, through Media Goblin. But it's not quite at the point where things are interconnecting. Um, so there, it's likely that some of that will actually end up changing on the architecture side of things. But we did create kind of a spec out doc with the general idea of how things would go. Uh, you, what's... Um, so, you mentioned um, email as the classic federated service. Um, email, one of the things that makes email really difficult is spam. Do you have, obviously you can't have a perfect answer to spam, have you, how much have you thought about it? Um, so, so I, I have, uh, um, so what's happened in the world of spam, um, actually, so a lot of what I end up doing, if it's not obvious enough, I'm riding off of the heels of an extremely smart person named Ed Evan Perdromo, and he has been working on a, um, a server called Spamacity, which unfortunately um, is in its own ways kind of centralized, but, uh, um, but it is like, it, what it is trying to do is actually try to use all the kind of common ideas, uh, but it's also free software at the moment. But it, anyway, it uses all the common ideas of what the kind of Bayesian filtering and all sorts of other things that we do for spam filtering and moves it into the kind of the pump.io stack. So what I'd like to do is actually try to uh, make it easy for people to be able to just click and kind of turn on a service to connect to some sort of service like that for their spam filtering. Um, but, uh, I, I think it's going to be difficult. You know, spam is difficult in email, but it's not impossible. Spam Assassin actually does a pretty good job of filtering out spam on my local server, so we can have free software alternatives to these types of things. But but yeah, it will be difficult. That's that's the reality of anything that's networked. Um, spam is a very 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 difficult question indeed, and I think the only true solution for spam can, in theory, be uh, so some kind of social social network filtering. Which means that people people have a so, so, social score that uh, the, 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 some kind of scoring networks gives them because in the kind of biasing filtering and so on will always be fault because the spam will just improve too much that and well I. I the, there, there's a number of, I mean, yeah, every every spam system that's working now is really having to take a, a multiple set of approaches right now. And the reality is, is that, yes, um, the network service, getting to a point of total free network services actually involves solving a lot of hard problems. And one of the actual issues that I think we're actually having right now is that um, the part of the current trend is get really excited about the new thing that somebody ends up announcing, throwing up a Kickstarter page for, and they start... They go for a number of months and then it kind of disappears. We actually need to be focusing on these years. I think this is actually a, um, a many year problem that we actually have to focus on. Um, and we're going to end up running through a lot of these difficult problems and have to work through them, but it's going to just continue to be a lot of work. But anyway, yes, go ahead. A what? Oh, plus 18, like a pornography Media Goblin site. Yeah, sure, you can use Media Goblin for porn. <laughs> uh, oh, yo, oh, filtering for me. Uh, for, so we have one of our oldest bugs in the tracker is actually, um, is actually like trying to figure out uh, how to be able to handle the um, kind of marking whether or not things are, uh, are like pornographic or not. Um, and uh, we actually haven't really seen Media Goblin being used for porn right now, which I guess probably has not really spurned anybody to work on that bug. Um, but uh, um, but my current thoughts on that are a few things. Uh, uh, one, uh, it's probably actually um, it is going to be something that's going to be a bit tricky. Um, but you, it, it's not totally impossible to be able to tag and mark things as you know 18 plus and stuff like that. We can hope that sites actually end up being good and actually kind of you know marking those types of things and maybe you can actually mark things as a blacklist as if like you know you want to be very careful about that on your site and want to say like I I know that this stuff tends to be you know fairly raunchy and and I want to be careful about that on my site 
Um, but uh, actually, Evan Prodromo made an interesting comment on Pump.io, which is that maybe this could actually, federated services could actually be a real boon to parents who are concerned about these types of things. Because if you're actually able to run a site and you're actually able to help um, you know, handle the moderation of those types of, uh, like, of some of like which sites uh, users people are subscribing to, and your kids are young enough where they're not technically savvy enough where they're going to be able to get around all your stuff anyway, but they're young enough that you're going to actually be able to, um, to spend some time on this, well then adults could probably actually handle some of the whitelisting of these types of things. Like, yeah, you can subscribe to this channel and this channel and this channel. So I actually think there's ways around it, uh, ways forward with it, but uh, we haven't tackled it yet in Media Goblin itself. Um, but yeah. I think that's oh. that. Sorry. Oh, go ahead and then uh, he's next. Uh, I think the problem with um, some sort of content filtering comes back to the same thing as with spam. Uh, you need to have some sort of some sort of system that that uh, you can trust to actually filter that. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, Is there any support for anonymity of the members of this generation? Uh, there's. Uh, there's no anonymity support as far as I know uh, in the pump protocol. There is privacy support. Well, I mean, there's privacy support, which is not necessarily the same as anonymity support. Uh, um, I mean, you could be about as anonymous as Bitcoin, which is to say not very anonymous at all. You know, right? People think like, Bitcoin, great. It's an anonymous currency, an anonymous currency where we keep the history forever of every single transaction that happens, right? Like. Um, you can actually be a bit more anonymous than that, in fact, because you're not going to actually store the transaction of everything ever. Um, so, so, but I mean, you know, sure, if somebody wants to actually run a, um, a site for journalists who are in a, um, who are, or people who are in like a, a socially repressed area, um, and they want to get around censorship and speak to journalists or something like that, well, maybe they can connect to a media goblin instance where anonymous registration is allowed. And sure, they might have some sort of user ID that, um, that gets persistent and ends up appearing a bunch of places, but um, it's still actually a lot more censorship resistant than Twitter or Flickr or YouTube or any of these types of things. Um, and you could have a way of people being able to push stuff out there. So I actually think ano anonymity is totally possible. Um, but, you know, somebody making an anonymous post, I actually don't think it's in the spec for uh, the Pump API. Uh, and I, I'm not actually completely sure it's really necessary at the moment. But, um, uh, yes. Uh, Uh, I, I can't hear you. Can you say that again? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, so the, the, I, it's possible to do aggressive censorship of any network system. It's a lot harder when it's spread out. Um, but Well, we, we're still moving forward in the Federation space, so that's, that's, that's kind of like next step after that. So, yeah. Uh, is that it? It seems like, it sounds like, uh, are we getting towards the end of time? Okay, well, that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Greatly appreciated.